In this particular session, we're going to be talking about uh, general uh, anxiety disorder and separation <clears throat> anxiety disorder. When you think about the stats, there are 40 million Americans who are 18 and older who are affected by anxiety. And six million of those, almost seven million of those, are affected by general anxiety disorder. I'm gonna mention some things to you throughout the day and I'll, I'll try to keep it functional for us. Uh, we're not gonna cover all the different forms of anxiety or depression. So just like medical doctors who have specialists and um, you know, when you get into their uh, medical books, there's just so much there that they have to generalize and say these are general areas we're talking about. The Diagnostic Manual for Counselors, the DSM-5, is almost a thousand pages. And this is being recorded, so I have to be real careful what I say about the DSM-5. It's our Diagnostic Manual. I didn't say that, didn't I? Uh, but there are a lot of things in there that, you know, are just vague, general, uh, kind of hard to explain to people, and just to be honest with you, kind of hard for therapists to put their minds around. Because it's written by professional people that sit down and say, okay, what are we going to call that? We used to call it this, what are we going to call it now? And unfortunately, get to be some political things in there, you know, a little pressure foot here, and, and got to do that here. And, and so uh, it'd be helpful if they just said that trained people deal with taking care of folks. But regardless, uh, it defines things that are helpful to us. And we'll talk about those in a general way here so that when you hear the terms or your family member are dealing with anxiety, depression, and they tell you what the therapist said or tell you what their medical doctor said, you'll have a frame of reference to say, okay, well, that, that makes sense. Understand that that's why um, they're having to do it that way, to address those things. So general anxiety disorder is an apprehension or uneasiness that occurs more days than not for at least six months. Remember the general definition we gave? You know, here's what anxiety is, this, this uneasiness this anxiousness that we might feel, and it would be because of a stimulus in environment, we might just respond to that, and it's all over. That's normal anxiety. But we'd start developing a pattern here where this kind of feeling and, and this kind of reaction takes place over a longer period of time. Now we have a disorder. Now it means that we can't function like we would normally be able to function. Now all of a sudden, maybe we can't do our job the way we need to do our job. And maybe now our relationship with our spouse or our care of our children might be affected because we have this anxiety level that will not allow us to focus and pay attention and to do the things that we would normally do. It might be a loss of job. And you look at the, the picture on the screen. Boy, did I see a lot of that over this last year. People had their lives together and had that job. They worked hard for it. They uh, secured a, a way to take care of their family. All of a sudden, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, that company might have gone completely out of business. You can't call on your customers. So what do you do about it? Well, there's certainly anxiety in it. And when you said, well, it continues for at least six months. Well, how long did this COVID experience continue? It was longer than six months, wasn't it? Now, you're still concerned about your job. You're still concerned whether we're gonna get back and can I get those customers back? And so now this becomes a, a problematic thing for you. You can't have normal conversations with people like you used to because what's on your mind is, how am I gonna feed my family? How am I gonna pay my bills? Those become immediate concerns for you. You would have three or more of the following that would last that six month period. That restlessness, easily fatigued, uh, difficulty concentrating, maybe irritability, muscle tension, sleep disturbance. Any of that sound familiar to you? 
over the last year and a half. Uh, those are things that general anxiety uh, depicts. You see, if you let that become a pattern and you don't narrow it down to what you can deal with and function with, then when COVID is over, you've got a reaction to things. Even if you've got a job, you say, how long am I going to have this job? Well, what if something else happens? Boy, what if, what if somebody else who um, knows a little more than I do takes my job? How am I going to feed my family? How am I going to make up all those uh, payments I got behind? And all that began to be a cycle where it's a continuous anxiety that you have. It affects what you do, how you do it. That's a little different than what we referred to earlier, just normal anxiety and response to uncertainty. In my family, and again, this has been recorded, so I'm not mentioning any family names, but in my family, I'm one of 11 children, by the way. Uh, I'm number eight out of 11. We have six girls and five boys, all same parents, if you wonder. This is not a, a, a blended family. This is, uh, we all look alike, and we all have a lot of the same tendencies. But I'm number eight. And I tell folks, you know, when I became a counselor, uh, you get in the diagnostic manual, it says, well, you know, the oldest child has a complex, and the youngest child has a complex, and the middle child has a complex because of where they fall into the, to the birth order, and, and number eight gets nothing. I mean, there wasn't even a complex left for me until Denise told me I couldn't leave singing. You know, and then all of a sudden I got a, a complex. And so when you, you look at in my family, um, you know, some not so pleasant things have happened along the way. And uh, my parents divorced when I was eight. And so I was raised by a, a single mom. And so some of the older siblings are like parents to me. But because of some things that happened in our family, there's a little bit of, of anxiety in some of them that are accentuated. And even when we always have our family reunion that's Saturday after Thanksgiving, every year. And so we have to rent a, uh, a building at a state park because nobody really has a house that can stand up to that kind of crowd anymore, you know? Before my mother died, we had 72 of us present with all of her offspring, you know, just mother and her children and what we caused. And so we rent this place and we all get together and all the men sleep on one side and all the women on the other and we have a snoring contest, you know, just to uh, see who can really shake the raptors these days. That's our fun uh, as old people in this family. But every year in this get together, uh, I have a couple of siblings. I shouldn't even say whether it's brothers or sisters. So if, if they do watch this, they can't figure it out. But I have a couple of siblings that every year we get together and they'll say, oh, I'm so glad everybody was here because this may be the last year everybody's here. And I'm thinking, now wait a minute, we're here. Let's just enjoy being here. Let's not worry about the time when we won't be here. But that little moment of anxiety, what's that going to be like? And this may be the last year. Now, we're still all here. But this past year, guess what we had to do? There's three of us that kind of help plan that and, and make the reservations and uh, set up everything. And so three of us talked and said, all right, what do you think? And, uh, well, we're a bunch of old people. And they said, you know, uh, COVID affects the older population more than any other population. So uh, we're kind of a target group. Uh, probably don't need to be the ones to uh, to get all the family together and something happens, so probably don't need to have this this um, family reunion. That was a hard decision to make. And so when we announced it, those siblings would always say, well, this may be the last time we have to, well, that's probably a really good decision, but you know, uh, we could have caught the COVID and maybe none of us be there next year. <laughs> you know, so you're talking about a, a, a glass half empty, and if you fill the glass up, they pour it out just so they could function with it half empty. You know, just say, we may not all be here. 
And so that's the, if that gets to be a pattern, and with them it's a pattern. And I, my wife and I sit there together, and as soon as they start this, oh, isn't it good for us to all be together? And, uh, and then hugging each other and saying, you know, this may be the last year we'll look at each other, you know, glass half empty. They just poured half of it out. It wasn't because it was that way. They just decided the only way we were going to be able to function is say, just think, this may be it. And I'm just the opposite. You know, I don't uh, like to think of it that way. In fact, in describing that, uh, my wife and I talk about our disposition, you know, and I'm kind of a, if you're going to use that terminology, I'm kind of a, a, a guy that's uh, glass is half full. Uh, the glass is never empty to me. It's like there's something in there that you can rejoice about. And my wife is so practical. I said, well, she said, which is I? Which, which am I? And I said, well, you're not really either. I said, you're so practical that you just say, why would you mess up a glass? I'm just going to drink out of the can. You know, that's, that's kind of who she is. You know, it's not, uh, we're not going to mess up a glass by pouring it in with it half full or half empty. I'm just going to drink out of the can and uh, just save all those things. Now, we would have very little anxiety if that was our approach to life about everything. But here's the, the general anxiety that, that we need to be aware of, that COVID kind of accentuated that all of us got introduced to, didn't we? Like, oh, I don't really know what tomorrow we hold. How are we going to pay those bills? Hmm, is the bank going to work with me on that? Does the bank understand that all my customers have work for me to do, but I can't go and do it. Do they know that? And so, how many days do you think they thought about that? You think it caused any restlessness? You think they lost any sleep over it? You think they got a little irritable when they talked about it? Now, wait a minute. You ought to know that I can't make that payment because I can't go to work. And you think they were irritated about that more than one day? You see, those are the kind of things that you and I got to experience. We're not glad we experienced it. But I am glad we understand now what it feels like. What it looks like. For people who deal with it all the time. So that's, that is the essence of general anxiety. When we're talking about separation anxiety, probably the image that comes to mind, or at least... Uh, to most of us would be uh, a child afraid to be separated from his parents. And boy, some of you probably can remember the first day you went to school. You thought you were excited about going to school, but it didn't really dawn on you that when you went to school, your parents didn't go with you. You said, now wait a minute. I've got to be here all day without mama. What about my peanut butter and jelly sandwich about 2 o'clock in the afternoon just before I take my nap? Well, you're going to have a pallet at school and you can just take a nap without mama. Didn't think about that. That child experiences some separation anxiety. Well, I just want to go home. I had a cousin. We were in elementary school and, and uh, we lived on the farm. We lived 18 miles out of town, out, just out of Hamburg, Arkansas. You had to go all the way to the end of that road. My father's property joined the Louisiana line. So you almost ran out of Arkansas. And so we had to catch the bus. And so I had a, a cousin that lived up the road a, a little ways. And um, she was uh, had some older siblings. So she was born a little late in, in the family. And so she's really pampered. You know, she got all the, the, the good stuff. And uh, when she started the school, you know, she thought everybody was going to wait on her at school like they did at home. And they didn't. I mean, she had to read like everybody else. And she had to go to lunch like everybody else, and she had to get her milk and her tray, and, and nobody got it for her. And she, and, uh, she decided, well, this, this is not fun. And so they had to go get her. She was going to walk home from school. She wasn't going to wait on the school bus 18 miles. She didn't think about the miles. She just thought, I know where that road goes. You get on the school bus. That, that school bus goes all the way to the end of that road. And you get about halfway down that road. And my house is on the right. And that's where Mama is. I'm going to the house. And so they get to looking for her. Can't find her at school. And look downtown. And she's already left the city limits. She wasn't going to put up with any more of this 
separation anxiety. I'm not feeling this way anymore. I'm going home to mama. Now, folks, she finally outgrew that, but it took her coming to grips with that adjustment in life. But you see, if you had a traumatic experience, that excessive fear of separation from those whom we uh, are attached to, again, over a period of time where you have that kind of that feeling, this excessive worry about being away from home or family or from harm that might happen to the family. A lot of kids think that they protect their family. <laughs> you know, they think, well, what if mama needs me? And they worry about that. And if that is a pattern where they worry about that often, then it becomes dysfunctional for them. They can't think about things they really need to be thinking about or do things they really need to be doing because they have this overriding concern of their loved ones being separated from them. And maybe just being alone. Or maybe they have nightmares about it. Just being snatched away from their family. Or, or their family going off and never coming back. That's why when I'm counseling with, with parents about uh, what to say to their children when maybe a loved one dies in the family. And they say, how do we need to talk to them about it? And I say, well, be natural. Let them see you cry and, and you talk about what you would normally talk about. But choose your words wisely. Don't use general things like, well, Grandpa, to sleep. Wrong word. You see, they have a very concrete image of what it means to sleep. You go to bed and go to sleep, and now Grandpa went to sleep and they put him in a box. They put him in the ground. They covered him up with dirt. You see that traumatic for them. You can use the word, Grandpa died. They're not going to understand your, all your explanation about death, but that's a real word. And that's when the the spirit leaves the body, and you can say those kind of things without getting technical. Answer only their question, but make sure you answer their question. And don't choose words that soften things that are going to rob them of a word that they're going to really need to cherish and hold on to. Sleep is a respite that they need to be able to participate in. If you take that away from them, and separation from grandpa means you go to sleep, Here's what might happen to you. Don't say he's gone on a trip. You want to create separation anxiety in a, a child? Tell them that grandma's gone on a trip. And guess what? She never comes home. What do you think that's going to do to a child? Now that's what conversation we would normally have if I'm lecturing on separation anxiety. But this is a little different. Because you and I have all experienced the same thing over the last year and a half. We have experienced separation anxiety. From our physical families, from our spiritual families, from our co-workers, from our friends. And it's been traumatic. And it's lasted for more than six months. Let me give you a for instance, and, and you could fill in the blank yourself because you've had your own experiences. My brother-in-law had knee surgery. Out cutting his grass, tore a ligament in his knee, and so had to have the surgery. Uh, had taken all the precautions to make sure that he uh, didn't catch COVID. But when he went in to have the surgery, he contracted COVID. He also had an underlying condition of, of uh, a breathing uh, condition, COPD, contracted COVID. Had typical symptoms but couldn't breathe. Complicated because of COPD. So my sister calls 911, the ambulance shows up and they won't let her go with them. 
she has to see him loaded in the back of the ambulance. He leaves without her. They won't let her come to the hospital and visit him. His condition worsens. They have to transfer him to Little Rock. They put him on a bed. All this without her. Likely, every person in here has someone close to them that's had that experience. Now we know what separation anxiety feels like. And guess what? Days turn into weeks. Weeks into months. You think of the pattern develop? But I want to go be by his side. I, I, I want to have a conversation with him. They did get to talk to him on the phone until he couldn't talk anymore. And then they insisted that they take the phone and place it up to his ear and they would talk to him even though he couldn't respond. But it changed the way they grieved because of the separation. We're not here just to tell sad stories so all of us can be sad. We're just here to take the opportunity to say, now we know what it would feel like to feel helpless. That you can't get to someone that you love. Now all of a sudden, that anxiety level comes up anytime you have a loved one that gets sick. It's like, oh no, oh no. Would I ever see them again? I don't want to let go of them, and maybe I shouldn't call 911 because if they come and get him or come and get her, I might never see them again. It gets real complicated real quick, doesn't it? That's what that separation anxiety is about. Now we know. My sisters had nightmares about that. Did, did I do the right thing? Should I have done this? I wonder what he would want me to do here. No answers to those questions. Because we'd never experienced that before. Had another Right after COVID started, had an elderly member of the congregation, sweet, sweet lady, uh, wife of a, a retired military guy, and I, right after I removed, well, I, I moved across it back to my hometown, I, I preached his funeral, and um, just an interesting, interesting person. She moved all over the world with her husband in the military, and. Uh, just a fascinating person. Had her pilot license, and she's just a really impressive lady. And I'd go visit her in the home where she was staying and uh, help her put a puzzle together. She liked putting puzzles together. Well, COVID did. Guess what the preacher can't do? You can't visit. So in those facilities, when we're aging and we're trying to keep our minds active. She's going to put those puzzles together. She said, I'm not going to let my mind go to sleep. I'm going to you know, keep it active. And she might still be putting puzzles together. But guess what? Couldn't engage with people outside. She got sick. She got two daughters. One lived in Florida and one there locally. Neither one of them could go to her while she's sick. Finally, they got the call that she died. Talked to the funeral home, and the funeral home said, we have really, really, really strict guidelines. Um, you can't even come view the body. Are you kidding me? What do you mean I can't come? and view my mother's body. We protocol won't allow it. Do you think they experienced 
separation anxiety. You see, in our respect for our deceased loved ones, we go through this ritual of saying our goodbyes and honoring their wishes to go through that process and say this is what they would have wanted and this is how we make sure they get what they wanted. And now they might can do that on the phone and remember as much as they can, but they can't really be there. One of the saddest, saddest experiences that I've ever experienced in local work was that one. You know, ministers are all about comforting families. Ah, and if you're a minister with a PhD in marriage and family therapy, you ought to know how to comfort families. Guess what the preacher can't do? I can't, not only can I not go to the funeral home and, and help her with that process, I can go to her and help her grieve over the death of her mother. Her sister who lives in Florida can't come and be with her. They can't even grieve together as sisters. Now they had experienced separation before. They're military kids. They're military brats. They've grown up with their, their father having to go off to this uh, deployment and that deployment. And so they know something about separation. But they also know how that was navigated and how the reconciliation took place. But they never experienced anything like this. And I couldn't help but think that particular family, having experienced all the vast different things that they'd experienced in a military environment, could not have been prepared for this. Again, this is not to discourage us or make us sad all day. It's to look underneath all that and say, now we know what it looks like, what it feels like. And boy, we will never, ever again take it lightly. Say, oh, they're going to be back. Oh, don't worry about it. Well, that's part of life. Say, oh, well, that hurts so deeply I can't even explain it. I don't even know how to bring to the surface an understanding deep enough to be able to tell somebody what's going on. Now you go out a, a, a layer. That's the family response. Helpless. Hopeless. We're going to talk about that when we get to depression. What it's like to be helpless and hopeless. Well, most of us have really never experienced that in a, a prolonged way. That family did. They were completely helpless. They couldn't say, well, I'll tell you what. My mother has a will. She specified what's going to be in the will. And I'm coming up looking at the body whether you like it or not. No, that's not going to happen. Not going to be allowed to happen. So what do you do about it? Normally then, the minister, the elders, and the church folks, and boy, I don't know who all we have here, but I know in the congregation where I, I work, we are like the perfection of casserole making. <laughs> the way we deal with our grief outside the family is we feed the family. And that's a wonderful thing to do because the family just on uh, autopilot. They're just trying to function. And they've got guests coming in and all kinds of moving parts. And so it's a blessing to say, look, there's food at the, at the church building or there's food over here. Or we'll put this in your kitchen. Uh, it'll be available for you. Here are sandwich stuff so it won't spoil. Uh, whatever it is, we, we have that perfected. To say, we're going to take care of you. You don't worry about the food. Guess what we couldn't do? In fact... The daughter, she knew who we are. She knows who we are. And so she called me and said, Brother Jerry, please tell everyone not to prepare food. My family isn't coming in. I'm here by myself. 
I don't want to have to think about doing something with that food. She knew what was about to happen. I mean, we were about to poke the button and the, and the conveyor belt was starting to move. It's headed your way. And boy, it's going to be therapeutic for people. So all of a sudden, it's cut off. Those of us who would grieve for her and for the family and show our respect by preparing things for them, we can't help. We're so separated from them, we can't even express our shared grief with them. Do we know how it feels now? That separation? We want to embrace each other so badly. Or there's just something therapeutic in it when you just don't know what to say and you can't put it into words and you come to a loved one who's who just buried their, just lost their mother or their father or their spouse, and you just put your arms around them, and you weep with them. It's therapeutic for them. It's therapeutic for us. Guess what we couldn't do? We couldn't do any of the above. Now, I've been separated from my family before. I've traveled overseas on mission trips and I know that feeling of being away and you always had in that in your mind you I've got to take it home. <laughs> I, I know I'm going to trace those steps back and boy you know in three weeks or whatever it is I'm going to be home and you kind of get your mind prepared for that so you don't really feel the impact of that hopeless separation. Well I know what it feels like now. And me talking to that sister on the phone, just not the same. It's sitting next to her and crying with her. And I knew, I knew she was having to cry all alone. That she couldn't say goodbye to her mother. And have in her mind, this is the process mother would want it. This is the process we follow it. And I'm looking at my mother's body. And I know that I've shown her respect and I've done what she asked me to do. And I'm going through this ritualistic process of saying my goodbyes so I can heal on the other side. She didn't have that. She just separated. You know what happened? This seemed like the cruelest thing in the world to me. The funeral home said, when we're finished with the grave, we'll call you and you can go visit the gravesite. But you'll have to do that alone. I don't even know how you put your mind around that to you. I can't even go to the gravesite with her. She had to go alone. Wouldn't you know it? The day they called her, it was raining outside. She had to go to a gravesite in a place back where her mother was born, a place that this daughter never lived. Strange place with a grave where her mother was buried. Separation anxiety. Excessive fear of separation from those whom we end who are individuals that we're attached to. She's attached to her mother and it affected her in a painful way. As we think about those things, now when we have folks who are a little obsessed with not wanting to be away from each other, or, uh, not wanting their, their children to move off, or uh, it doesn't mean that we nurture that and we feed that or we encourage that, but now we ought to understand that. It's a real feeling to say, I don't want to let go because I don't want not to be able to have them back and work with that. Now we have a frame of reference. We know what it looks like. And we know how it feels. And may we do those things that we can do to make sure that that is taken care of. Now when you put that in an everyday context, um, are there situations, and I'm not asking a question for you to feel like you have to answer it, 
but I'm just asking for us to think it through. Are there circumstances that you could look back at and say, you know, that person always seemed strange to me because I just was so obsessed with, with uh, a fear of uh, separation. Uh, can you think of a situation where you had conversations with a person like that and you thought, get over it, you know? Why are you worked up about that? That's just part of life. Kids grow up and go away. You know, husbands go off on business trips and mission trips that are taken. Why are you so frantic about that? Not a big deal. Since they maybe have had a traumatic experience in their past where something did happen abruptly. Maybe they couldn't say goodbye. And now we know what that looked like. Our oldest son, when we uh, would go off on lecture ships, or Denise and I would go off together uh, for a brief period of time, invariably, I'm talking every single time. We get a call. Well, we had to call the doctor, because I'll just go ahead and mention his name, because I don't care if he sees this or not. Uh, <laughs> Say, well, Paul, Paul is sick, so we took him to the doctor, and they didn't really find anything, but um, the doctor said, just kind of watch him. Guess what had to happen? Uh, you know, one or two things got to happen. You got to call and console him and say, what's wrong, buddy? Oh, I don't feel good. What do you mean you don't feel good? Oh, how do you not feel good? I just don't feel good. We try to sort through that and just couldn't get a handle on it and say, kind of odd that it, you know, it, it doesn't happen until we leave town. When are you coming home? Like, well, you, we told you we're coming home Friday. How long is that? Well, you know, this is Wednesday. You have to have these conversations and he keep you on the phone just asking questions that he already knows the answer to. Sometimes we had to say, all right. You know, the doctor said, you know, probably doesn't be left, left alone. What does that mean? Come on. It might be serious. And so his parents, you can't say, well, we're just going to ignore it. Say, what if he really is sick? You know, all right, all right. We're on our way. Okay, good. What happened to that boy? It's like, yeah, this don't feel good. Like, okay, good. You know, that separation anxiety was just setting in on him. He, he wasn't sure how things were going to be navigated while we were gone. And he kind of found ways to plug that hole that he was feeling. And so, well, I understand that a little bit now with those, those things. I'm not sure if that light that blinks tell me I'm, my clock doesn't tell me that I'm out of time, but I, at the congregation where I am, the, the deacon in charge of the lights, he'll let you visit a while and then the lights blink. I thought we had a short there for a while, but what happened? He's saying, okay, your time's about up. You can take this to your house if you want to stay up any longer because the door's about to be locked and the lights are going to be turned off. So if that's a, the president just spoke, if that's a, a code here at this school, but, I need to kind of work that in my wife's code over here, so I'll know time's up. In our next session together, we're going to look at social anxiety and, and panic disorder. Mm. You've heard those terms before, haven't you? And now you really kind of have a framework, I think, for us to fully understand. I'm going to give you some illustrations of, of social anxiety in a personal way that will allow you to say, oh, well, I probably have had that experience before, or my wife's that way, or I have a child that way, or there's a, a sibling that you can deal with, but we want to take the things we learned today and say, all right, now we're going to be able to function with each other in a way we're not going to enable uh, dysfunction or disorder, but boy, we're going to be compassionate and empathetic. We have been blessed with an opportunity to be empathetic people. We can say without reservation, without qualification, we empathize with each other. Sympathy is, oh, I really feel sorry for Neil. You know, empathy is, wow, 
can only imagine what that'd be like if I was where Neil was and that was happening to me. Wow, I don't know how I would navigate that. I want to make sure I'm there for Neil because I don't know what that would be like. I'm trying to relate, putting myself where Neil is. We have been in this together. We are empathetic when it comes to depression and anxiety like we have never ever been before so let's use it let's use it to make sure that we're better people on this side of things and that we take those lessons learned and we make application of them so that we can join hands and hearts in such a way that we can help each other navigate situations like this and be wiser people for it appreciate your attentive nature and we'll take up um, there after the break.